So last time we had a quick look at how your business can make use of a cloud backup solution such as Acronis. Today we're going to take a much deeper dive into an overall strategy for your small business. And I'll explain why I've got such a huge collection of hard drives. You have a responsibility as a small business owner to make sure you get this right. So let's take a look at how you can do that and what happens when things go horribly wrong. Welcome back to the show. I'm quickly going to tag this on to the beginning of this video because I know a load of extra people have joined the channel from the video I made about the YouTube problems I've been having. So welcome on board folks. The bad news is there's no further updates from YouTube. Channel revenue is still effectively decimated and I'm still kind of deciding what to do with this channel. I've never been dependent on the AdSense revenue for this channel, but at the same time, if YouTube are continuing to put adverts onto my videos that I'm making and I'm not getting a fair cut of that, then I'm not playing that game. If you want to know more about the problems I've been having, probably the best place to follow along is on my Twitter. Gosforth Andy on Twitter or X or whatever it's called. There's a link down in the description below. Hopefully for everyone who has joined the channel on the YouTube front, this video shouldn't be entirely irrelevant to you because I've got a whole section coming up later on in this video about how I back up the gargantuan amounts of video data that I create for this crazy platform that we're all kind of on. So hopefully you'll get something from it and yeah, let's crack on. So I briefly mentioned last time, but I have a vested interest in this subject because I spent many years in a past life looking after data backup solutions for corporates and blue chip firms. I've worked in data centers with huge robot based backup libraries and spent a long time supporting infrastructure with SDLT based GFS rotations. I'm showing my age there and the nerds out there will know exactly what I'm talking about. It's kind of interesting that a lot of businesses are only learning about cloud-based backup solutions now. I started using a Segre-based online backups over 20 years ago now, so it's not a new thing. But that was well before the term the cloud had been invented, and back then we knew the cloud as basically being other people's computers. Anyway, here's a few things I want to cover off in this video. It's an important one, so grab yourself a notebook and a pen and a cuppa, and get yourself comfortable. I'll share my own personal data backup disaster that I had with you. I'll show you my own insane data backup regime that I've got now, now that I take things a lot more seriously. And I'll also show you a little spreadsheet that I've come up with that makes the whole process a lot easier. And I'll explain what the 321 backup rule is. Even if you stop watching this video here and miss out on all the exciting stuff, as a bare minimum, just remember this, one copy is no copies and two copies is one copy. In reality though, there's a lot more to it and you need to give this some thought and we're gonna take a deep dive into that a little bit later on, but to start off with, I want to explain to you what can happen when things really go wrong. So I'm embarrassed to say that 10 years or so ago, after I'd left the IT industry, luckily, my personal backup regime was pretty lax. It's the usual case of decorators' houses, I suppose. You see, I sat there with a bit of a false sense of security since my main business computer had a pair of big mirrored hard drives in it. And for me, that was enough. I mean, looking back, obviously it wasn't enough. If I'd gone to a customer and that was their backup strategy, I would have informed them in no uncertain terms that they didn't have a backup strategy. But you know, sometimes life gets in the way and you just kind of forget to sort these things out. So if you're not aware with mirrored hard drives, whenever you save something to one drive, it automatically gets copied onto the other drive straight away. So if one hard drive completely dies, you simply replace it and everything from the surviving disk will automatically copy itself over to the new replacement drive. This gets known as rebuilding the mirror. And until that mirror is rebuilt, your array, admittedly it's only a very small array, but your array is in a degraded state because effectively you've only got one drive that has all of your data on, but eventually it can take several hours for all of the data from that drive to write itself back onto this drive. But once that's done, and it all kind of happens automatically, everything is good and you're not in a degraded state anymore. And by the way, for all of you who are probably thinking right now, oh, this doesn't really apply to me, I save everything to the cloud. 
Well, remember the cloud is just someone else's computer. You still need to run backups. More about that later on. Anyway, Drive Mirroring, or RAID 1 for its technical name, is not a backup strategy. It just gives you an element of redundancy. For this strategy to even vaguely work, you've got to know that both drives are in good working order. In corporate world, you'd have 24 by 7 teams monitoring the state of drives in service to watch out for any faults. I didn't have a 24 by 7 team, and as it turns out, that would have been kind of pointless anyway, because it transpired that alerts weren't working on the drives to tell me that one of the drives had actually failed six months earlier. Eventually, the inevitable happened and the second drive failed. Hard drives die all the time, by the way. SSDs are a lot more reliable, but they're still not 100%. So anyway, it took me a good day to work out why I couldn't rebuild the mirror when I replaced the broken hard drive. The drive I was trying to rebuild the mirror from was already broken and effectively blank. Eventually the penny dropped that I had one hard drive that was completely blank and another hard drive with 10 years worth of critical data on it that was just making clicking noises. I approached a data recovery firm to see if I could at least get this drive repaired they wanted £2,000 minimum just to look at it and they couldn't guarantee that they could get anything back off it. It's difficult to describe the feeling of data loss. It kind of sets in like a sickness in the pit of your stomach. We're not just talking about spreadsheets and databases here. We're talking about years and years of personal photographs, pictures of the kids when they were growing up, our wedding photos and loads of other stuff that was literally completely irreplaceable. And the scariest thing was that I'd lost so much data that I wasn't even entirely sure what I'd lost. To cut a long story short, I ended up recovering the data myself using some slightly nerdy Linux-based hard drive recovery tools. I was very, very lucky. The whole recovery process took about a week because the drive was literally on the verge of 100% failure. But I managed to get back about 95% of the data I'd lost. But still to this day, that remaining 5%, I'm not entirely sure what I've lost. I do still come across stuff now where I've searched and searched and searched for a file and I can't find it anywhere. And it's like, ah, oh, it would have been in that 5%. It was probably one of the most stressful weeks of my life and honestly when you've gone through that sort of experience you start to take backups a lot more seriously. So let's talk about some of the most common things you need to protect against as a small business owner. The most obvious thing is hardware failure. Hard drives die and laptops get stolen and you need some way to get your data back if the data simply doesn't exist anymore. You've then got accidental or malicious file deletion, and this is specific to full files. I remember back in the IT days, whenever we'd get a backup restore request in, we used to joke about removing all the delete keys from everyone's keyboards. Files do accidentally get deleted all of the time, and you don't necessarily notice straight away. It's not until you come to need to use that file again that you realise that it's gone, and that could be months from when it was accidentally deleted. And of course, if you employ staff, there's a very real risk of malicious file deletion as well. If you had a disgruntled staff member who, for whatever reason, you might have had to let go, it's not unheard of for them to wreak havoc on the IT systems before they lose access to their account. And remember, if you're just using a data replication solution, so in other words, copying data from one hard drive to another hard drive, if that is your solution for backups, then you're not going to be covered for accidental file deletion. Since if you take me as an example, with mirrored hard drives, if a file's deleted on that drive, it will also get deleted on that drive. And then of course there's accidental file deletion, but inside the file. This is more common than you would imagine. So I'm not talking about deleting an entire file. I'm talking about the file still existing, but someone accidentally deleting the contents of that file. So imagine you've got your accounts held in a spreadsheet and you've got a sheet for each year of your accounting records and someone accidentally deletes a couple of the sheets from that spreadsheet. You might not notice until a year down the line until maybe you get audited or something like that and you realise that 
some key sheets are completely missing out the spreadsheet. You come to restore it from backup, you've got no idea when that was deleted out of the file, so you need to be able to go back to specific versions of a file, not necessarily just the last good backup. And then of course there's file corruption, viruses, malware, ransomware, all of that will kind of lump together and that's where your file still exists but it's been corrupted in some sort of way and the only solution really is to get that file from a backup and restore it to the state it was in before it became corrupted. This is probably one of the most critical ones since it's completely out of your control. You or a staff member might download a file, you accidentally infect a computer on your network with a virus. That virus might have ransomware in it where it encrypts files on your hard drive. You'll not even know about it. A lot of this sort of stuff can sit dormant for years until a trigger point is reached and then suddenly you realize that you can't get access to your files because something's come up on the screen saying that you need to send money to some far-flung country to get your files on your laptop or on your computer decrypted. In that situation with ransomware, there is very, very little you can do. You either need to cough up to pay for the files to be decrypted or you need to restore the files from backup. Malware and viruses can grind businesses to a halt and I've seen it for very, very big businesses as well. If you get complacent about that side of things, trust me, you've got a whole world of pain coming to you. That's another topic for another day, but generally speaking, your get out of jail free card is good backups. It's also worth mentioning at this stage that putting everything on the cloud isn't necessarily a good solution, especially if you've got all your eggs in one basket. What happens if your cloud provider goes bust or they decide they just don't want to work with you anymore? We're living in a very strange age of cancel culture and what happens if your cloud provider just switches things off? The other thing with cloud is that you need to consider the time it might take to run your initial backups and get your data back again. If you're backing up a lot of data, that can take days or weeks. Some providers will allow you to send a hard drive to them to do your initial seed backup. And then if you need to restore a lot of data, they'll post a hard drive back out to you. But that's still going to take a few days. And as an example on this one, I tried running a backup to one of the cheaper US based kind of free backup providers. And the initial seed backup was going to take over a month to complete. So it just wasn't viable. Obviously with modern internet speeds, that's becoming less of a problem, but it is still something that you need to consider. How long can your business survive to be offline? And how long is it gonna to take to get everything back up and running again? We're kind of starting to think about business continuity and disaster recovery here, which is a bit of a separate topic. I will cover that on a separate video one day, so do hit subscribe. But it does all need to be considered as one overall backup strategy. Another thing you need to consider about storing everything on the cloud and just kind of putting your head in the sand and hoping that that solves everything, which it doesn't, remember, it's just other people's computers, but that data can still be deleted or corrupted. Now, different cloud providers have different approaches to how they back up the data that is stored on the cloud. Some don't back it up at all, by the way, and put the responsibility back on you. But even if we take, for example, Microsoft Office 365 or Google Drive, they back up their data in different ways. So you need to be aware of how that works and how you would get that data back in the event of a disaster. Again, we'll probably cover that topic in a separate video in terms of backups of Office 365 and Google Drive and things like that, because it is quite a big subject, but you do need to give some thought to it. And apart from anything else with cloud-based solutions, what do you do if the internet goes off? At least if you've got everything locally stored, you can still potentially keep your business ticking over. But there's plenty of situations I've seen where a digger digs through a cable in the street and for a period of time, you've got no internet access whatsoever and you just can't connect to your cloud provider. So for that reason alone, I always suggest that you have at least one copy of the most critical data that you need to run your business, even if it's just a spreadsheet with all of your customer contact details in so that you can tell them that there's been a problem. I would always suggest you keep at least one copy of that on site as well as off site on the cloud. Anyway, all of that neatly ties in my 
now slightly OCD backup regime that I've got, I'm not expecting this to be a solution that you put in place unless you work with large amounts of video data or audio data or anything that uses up a lot of space. But hopefully from seeing the way that I handle things now, you can kind of pick and choose the relevant bits out of it and you can come up with a solution for yourself that works for your business. It'll not come as any surprise to you that I've come up with a spreadsheet to help me sort this quandary out. And on this spreadsheet, I'm thinking of five key factors in terms of the data that needs to be backed up. And that is the volume of data. In other words, how much data actually needs to be backed up and how long is that likely to take? The sensitivity of the data. So in other words, what happens if that data fell into the wrong hands? How bad would that be? How often is the data accessed? How often is the data changed? And how important is the data? So in other words, how bad would it be if you lost that data forever and there was no way of getting it back? So here is the spreadsheet and I know what you're going to be thinking, what on earth is going on here? But don't panic, what we're going to start off by doing is we're just going to hide all of these rows and we'll just start off with the very top row and I'll take you through everything kind of line by line and I'll show you how I'm making use of this and then you can potentially come up with something similar for yourself. It's really not that complicated. You should be able to do an analysis like this for your data in under half an hour. So I've zoomed in just a little bit so you can see what's going on and you can see the first item that we're talking about is system data. So that's like your operating system and the files that kind of make your computer work, program files, all that sort of thing. Now, obviously, I'm only talking about one computer here, but you can do this analysis across as many machines as you want. Worst case scenario, you would have to do a full manual reinstall from scratch if you lost that data. And then we've got these five categories that we talked about earlier. So volume of data, I would put this as a medium. The reason it's important to know that is because when you start getting into high volumes of data, it's not really practical to back it up to a cloud type solution. Although we'll cover that later on. Sensitivity, what would happen if that data fell into the wrong hands? So I'm keeping this as a low for me, but obviously if you deal with particularly sensitive data, as part of your operating system on your computer, then you would maybe set that as a medium or a high. Next along, we've got the access rate and change rate, and both of these are high. But coming along the next one, the importance for me is relatively low because absolute worst case scenario, I could just reinstall everything from scratch. Remember, we're not talking about any user data here. We're just talking about system data. As I say, the operating system, and program files and stuff like that. And then we're coming along to our copies of the data. How are we storing our original copy? Well, the original copy is on the C drive, the SSD as part of uh, the computer or laptop or whatever. And then how are we backing it up? Well, all I do is a periodic system image backup. There's various tools that you can use for that. I'm not gonna go into that in here, but I do a system image and I store that both as an on-site copy and as an off-site copy as well. No real point in backing this data up to the cloud. It's quite a high volume of data. For me, it's not really important enough to back up to the cloud, but that could be different for you. Next one down, I've got current projects. Now I'm gonna run through this one quite quickly because it probably won't apply to the vast majority of people out there unless you are some sort of video creator, like you create YouTube videos or you deal with large volumes of video data for something else. For example, you could be a wedding videographer or something like that. Then you're gonna be dealing with high volumes of video data and you need to think about ways that you're gonna back that up. So for this, we've got the volume of data is high. For me, the sensitivity of the data is low. If that data fell into the wrong hands, I really don't care. It's all on YouTube in public anyway. But for you, again, using the videographer as an example, if you're videoing someone's wedding, then I would say that is high sensitivity. You would never want that falling into the wrong hands. And then we've got the access rate and change rate. Well, these are both really high for me. I'm creating videos literally every day. And the importance is really high as well. If I lost that data, I would have a major problem. Now, the big thing about video data is that generally it's too big to back up to the cloud in any 
practical sense. But at the moment, we're only talking about the current projects that I'm working on. So we're looking at about 400 gig of data that I'm working on at any one time. I've got the primary copy is sitting on an internal SSD drive. And then what I do is a periodic on-site backup to an external SSD drive as well. I don't personally bother with an off-site copy of this data because generally at this stage, it's still sitting on the original memory cards that were used in the cameras. And I just don't wipe those memory cards until we've gone to a further level of archive later on, which I'll show you. Next one, and this is a really important one that's gonna probably impact most businesses out there, and this is day-to-day -day admin data. So we're talking here about spreadsheets, for me, video scripts, Word documents, your business accounts, and all that sort of thing. This is generally speaking, irreplaceable low volume data. So again, you can see the volume column we've got is low. Sensitivity is obviously high. You're talking about your company accounts and stuff like that. Access rate is high, change rate is high, and importance is high, but it's not a lot of data. Spreadsheets and things like that are tiny. So I'm only talking about four gig of data per year or something like that. I tend to carry forward quite a lot of data from year to year as well. So I can cross reference to older years, but I do periodically archive stuff off as well. But anyway, the way that I store that is that we've got an internal SSD drive, and primarily that data backs up to the cloud. It's perfect for cloud backups because it means it's gonna run automatically every night. It's all encrypted and because it's a relatively low volume of data, it's easy to get it back as well. But I don't want all my eggs to be in one basket with the cloud. So I also do a periodic backup of the data to external drives, one on-site copy and one off-site copy. And I do a yearly rolling archive as well. And what that means is absolute worst case scenario, I can get everything back off either of these two drives, either the on-site copy or the off-site copy. And then if there's anything that hasn't been caught up on those drives where I haven't had a chance to do this kind of rolling archive, I can get that back from the cloud. So yes, for this data, I am technically backing it up three times, but really for me, the cloud backup is the primary backup of that data. Next up, we've got photos and videos and whether these are personal photos, so for example, family and friends or business related photos that you take, we've got to deal with this in a slightly different way because it's not the same sort of data as spreadsheets and Word documents. The volume of the data is much, much higher. The sensitivity is potentially very high if you're talking about family photos and things like that, that you really don't want falling into the wrong hands. The access rate is pretty high, but the change rate is low. And what I mean by that is once you've taken a photo, it's gonna be very rare that you then edit that photo and change it. And then of course, we've got the importance of the data, which for me is very high. So these are irreplaceable photos. If you lost them, that's really, really bad news. And here is how I back it up. We've got the primary copy on an internal SSD drive a separate one to the operating system, but I've only got the latest year backing up to the cloud. Otherwise I would be paying for terabytes of cloud backup when you work it out over many, many years. So what I do is a yearly archive of all of that data and that gets archived off every year to an on-site and off-site hard drive. And once that archive is done, I delete that off the cloud backup. There's really no point in having it backed up three times over the course of maybe 20 years or something like that. But for your most recent year, it just means your backups are happening automatically and you don't really need to think about it. Obviously you might be making use of automated backups from your phone and stuff like that, but there's pros and cons to that. It can easily get out of control the amount of data that you end up copying to the cloud. So this is a slightly more filtered approach where I copy the photos onto the local computer. It automatically gets backed up to the cloud anyway through my nightly automated backups. And then once a year, I archive it off to what's known as cold storage. Next up, I'm gonna group these two together. So we've got audio productions and video productions. It's very specific to people who deal with audio and video data. So I'll run through this really quickly. For me, the audio data is recordings of bands I was in and stuff like that. And the video productions tend to be more personal video productions, 
not YouTube video production. So this is um, like holiday videos and things like that. Change rate and access rate, I've got as medium and low on these. And then the importance of the data is high and very high. Again, you can see the volume of the data that we're talking about here, about 66 gig of audio data, but about half a terabyte of video data. And for me, again, this is simply a case of backing it up every now and then. It's not an automated backup because the data doesn't change very often, but I simply copy it onto an on-site drive and an off-site hard drive, simple as that. Then again, very specific to my workflow, but we've got downloaded software and downloaded music. So this tends to be royalty free music that I've downloaded to make videos and things like that. There's a fair amount of data, but the sensitivity is low, access rates low, change rate is low, and the importance is low. Absolute worst case scenario, if I lost this data, I would just re-download it from the internet. But that would be a bit of a ball ache. So for me, it is useful to keep a backup copy of it, simply to save the time of having to re-download everything. But I've only got one backup of it, and I keep that off-site. And then finally, we're getting into the realms of video projects again. So if you don't deal with video projects, you can skip over this little bit. But for me, this is all of my YouTube projects. And that really falls into two categories. Videos that have gone live and I've finished editing them, but I need to keep the footage for future reference. And videos that haven't gone live yet and maybe that will never go live. So I refer to those as back burner projects. Sometimes I film things, it's kind of stuff from the cutting room floor if you like. I might end up using it later down the line for B-roll or something like that, but I'm not using it on any current project. But for the archive video content, what I'm talking about here is a backup copy of every single YouTube video that I've ever made. And this is insane volumes of data. A lot of people just don't bother to keep this, but again, because of my hoarding tendencies, I do keep hold of it. And you can see how I've categorized it here. I'm not gonna go into that in a huge amount of detail, but I will tell you how I back it up. And you're probably gonna think I'm a little bit crazy. Because video data takes up so much space, I'm now backing up nearly 50 terabytes of data. This is only half of my hard drive collection. I've got the same again stored off site. It's crazy. Now, a lot of people at this stage are gonna say, why don't you have a NAS? And that would really be kind of crazy because most of this data is never accessed. You know, the, we're talking about an access rate that's low and a change rate that's low, but the importance of it is high. I don't want to simply delete the original video data because I might need it later down the line if I want to re-edit a video, for example. And for me, the ideal storage solution for this is cold storage. In other words, it's copied to physical hard drives that are left switched off and they are cold. There's no point in this data sitting on a sand with the disc spinning 24 seven. Luckily, I've still got contacts in the IT industry who keep me fed with old SATA hard drives after they've been upgraded to SSDs or whatever, and it saves them paying for the drives to be destroyed because I will fully overwrite them with video data. When you're dealing with that volume of data across so many hard drives, it needs to be organized. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to find it. So needless to say, I've got spreadsheets so that I know exactly what drive, what video data is on so I can find it if I need it in the future. But obviously, it's up to you how far you want to go with something like that. Let me know in the comments if you do deal with large volumes of video data. How do you handle it? For me, as I say, I don't think a SAN or a NAS is the correct way to go with this because the data never changes and it's accessed so rarely that I think cold storage is the best way of going about it. But a NAS is significantly more convenient because you don't have to go plugging drives in and looking for the correct drive. But anyway, there you go. That's my backup strategy. Make of it what you will. Is it perfect? No, probably not but hopefully you can pick and choose stuff from a backup strategy like this that will help your business. Remember for most people, the only thing really that you're gonna be worried about is this row here, maybe the photos and videos row as well, but everything else, if you're dealing with audio and video data, that can be problematic. So what exactly is the three, two, one backup rule? Well, you've probably worked it out for yourself by now, but basically it means you need to have three copies of your data held on two different types of media with at least one copy being held off-site. 
So in other words, by three copies of your data, that means one original copy and two backups. And those two backups can be on anything you want, as long as it's on two separate things and one needs to be off site. So in other words, you could have one backup to a NAS or a hard drive or a SAN, depending on the size of your company. And then you could have your offsite backup as being a cloud-based backup. Or if you've got two offices, you could have two NASs or two SANs that replicate to each other. So you could back up to this one and then that copies its data over to this one. As long as they're on two different sites, that's the main thing. Because you need to consider, okay, you might have the world's best NAS device with like 100 hard drives in it, all doing all sorts of fancy RAID things and redundancy and replication and all that. But what happens if someone steals it or there's a fire or there's just some sort of physical problem with the device, which means that you've lost your on-site copy. You've got to have an off-site copy as well. Now, although this is a fairly foolproof strategy, I do have to be realistic here. Most small business owners I know of aren't backing up their data at all. To suddenly expect that they're gonna have two backups of the data with one backup being off-site is probably a little bit unrealistic. Quite a few of you will have all of your data stored on the cloud and pretend that you don't need to back your data up. And we've proven that there's certain types of data that you simply don't need to back up that many times. It's just overkill. So the 3 2, one backup strategy is kind of an ideal solution, but it's not the be all and end all. You do need to put a little bit more thought into it. The key thing though, is that if you use a spreadsheet like the one I've shown you and actually think about where stuff is gonna get stored, you can come up with a folder structure that meets the requirements of how your backups are gonna work. So for example, if you've got terabytes of video data all mixed in with your main admin spreadsheets and personal photographs and all of that, your backups are gonna be an absolute nightmare. Because if you can't filter the big stuff from the little stuff, you're probably just gonna to have to back everything up. And backing up terabytes of video data over onto a cloud solution is not fun, trust me on that one. And obviously there's a cost of backing up stuff that just doesn't need to be backed up as well. If you're a website member on the Small Business Toolbox, of course, I will include that spreadsheet as a thing you can download, link in the description below. There's really nothing fancy in it. You can just quickly take a screenshot of this and build it yourself. As I say, I've made a separate video all about using a Cronus for cloud backups. I've used it for several years now and find it works really well, but just bear in mind, it's not the be all and end all. You need an overarching backup strategy to make sure that you can back up everything correctly and you can get the data back as quickly as you possibly can. For now, folks, let me know what you do for backups. Have you had any data loss disasters? How did you manage to get through it? How did it impact your business? It's certainly a subject that needs to be taken a lot more seriously by all small business owners out there and big businesses as well. If nothing else, hopefully this has given you a few ideas of where to start. Good luck on your small business journey and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.